I'm Pam Hoffman, Everyday Spacer. Oh, Cl oh. Uh, Cliff here from uh, Queensland, Australia. If you're ever down my way, come and say good day. Until then, check out my Pomona Astronomy Club page on Facebook. Yeah, let's just show you that real quick. Oh, I, I have the, over. I gotta hit the button. Hold on. <laughs> I gotta hit the button. See, it there, started already. There it is. Um, I've got over mm -hmm. three hundred astronomers on um, on Facebook all over the world, putting stuff on on my page. So yeah, I remember. You never you never know what you might see, and you'll get to see all those pretty wonderful pictures that uh, uh, amateur astronomers around the world uh, can do. All right, like so. myself. Uh, welcome, Janie. Thanks for joining us. Yep, amazing. Yep, he's on this side this time. <laughs> I'm on this side. <laughs> All right, so in Everyday Space, we show regular folks how to personally and directly participate in space exploration, science, and astronomy. Oh, we should do this too. So Jeff said this before. <laughs> He'll be in the peanut gallery heckling us. Yeah. Uh, we're here on Friday nights at 9 p.m. Pacific time, 12 midnight Eastern time, and 5 a.m. on Saturday in Germany. We're broadcasting live from Thousand Oaks, California. Tonight we have a guest. Help us welcome Stephen Eckrode. He'll we'll be back in exactly 8.3 seconds. So <laughs> don't touch that dial. <laughs> another comment uh, yep hey, jeff is here enjoying the peanuts <laughs> he's enjoying the peanuts hey scott thanks for joining us hey scott all right very cool go ahead so S stephen eckrode is a scientist and an engineer with a degree in physics and practical expertise in emerging electrical power technologies he is a member of mensa and his hobbies include astronomy electromechanical tinkering nature photography gardening and theology he is married and has traveled widely and currently resides in Cam Camarillo, Camarillo. <laughs> Cam Camarillo. Camarillo California. Um, not very good on my Spanish, sorry. Uh, Stephen Agro <laughs> writes hopeful and uplifting science fiction and has completed four novels in his Telfer series, Telfer Copernicum uh, 296. Archer, uh, Archer, where are the books? <laughs> uh, and Remnant. I, I had planned to have the books here. Oh, you know what? I can show the picture. Show the picture. If I could just find it. There it is. There's the Those book. are the books, folks. Those are the books. And we will we'll flash that up again as well later. All right. So let's see. Where are we? So are we the, the books are available online in local bookstores. And Pam will put up the link. Yeah. And you put the link up there. It's going to bring them as an end. Steve, what would you like to share with us tonight, mate? <laughs> well, it's a hell of a show. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> oh, boy. I'm not too used to this. Sorry, folks. That's okay. But, uh, we're we're yeah. very informal here. And we have Daniel with us. Always love the science. Hi, Daniel. Show. Yes. Yes, I'm live. Yes, and, and I really Ooh. like that kind of science fiction. A scientist that writes science fiction. Fabulous. And I know you could be on several episodes with us. Uh, but we'll talk about that later. All right. So go ahead, Stephen. Thank you, Pam. And thank you, Cliff and Jeff in absentia. This is also my first time on this show. So um, we'll see how, uh, see how we go. I can do it. So let's queue up the uh, presentation. The title right. will come up on the first page. I spent uh, a good many years in part of my career um, dealing with the development and deployment of superconducting power technologies, Ooh. mostly superconducting cables, but the, we'll talk about those uh, types of equipment in this presentation. And I've developed this, superconductivity is something that is an emerging technology. It's, uh, it is, you'll see that it's being used around the world Many of them are in STEM demonstration projects, but there are some commercial ones as well. So this is an important technology for people to know about. It's got a lot of good benefits, and it's a very green technology. And mm. it supports other green technologies as well. So what we have here is what I'm calling a layperson's 
primer or primer on superconductivity, or at least on some aspects of superconductivity. So Yay. we will get started. And the first thing to notice is that resistance is futile. <laughs> <laughs> you will see why in just a moment. So the agenda here is I'm going to start out with an analogy to water to help understand um, what is superconductivity is all about. Then we'll talk about superconductors and the things you can build from them. And then we'll talk about applications to power. I'm a power engineer, electrical power. By what I mean is what the utility companies supply you. That's the utility companies are power companies. And so this is an application in power. There are other applications of superconductivity all the way from the electronics in your cell towers to outer space and um, satellite technology and everything and medical electronics. So everything in between. Superconductivity touches a lot of our world. I'm going to be focusing mostly, almost entirely on the power domain. So we're going to be talking, and in particular, not just all of the power domain, but focusing more specifically on cables. These are the things that transmit the power from the power plants to your house. And we'll be talking about those cables. They're, they're underground. You don't see them, um, but they're there. I mean, there are current ones now that are not superconducting, and the superconducting cables will replace the older ones. We'll talk about that. And then I'd like to close with a future vision. Quick comment. Daniel and, says the universe itself must be kind of a superconductor because energy can neither be created nor destroyed, right? <laughs> this is true. Uh, I'm sure it's quite correct. Um, the universe is what, what we're talking about, however, was the moving from the energy from one place to another. And we'll see about that. So thank you, Daniel, for the comment. I'm going to start here with uh, uh, the example, uh, a an, a, a, uh, an example using water. So here you see a water tower on the left, and you see a sprinkler system and your faucet on the right. And in order to get water um, into your home from the water tower, you have pipes. The pressure of the water is determined by the height of the tower. Ah. And the resistance of the pipes uh, is, has to be overcome. So this, is, this goes on every day. Um, now we'll look at something here. First of all, you've got, in order to get the water to flow adequately to your house, you've got to have pressure and you've got to have a large enough pipe. The water tower establishes the pressure, the pipe size determines the flow. So there you go. Now, for a given tower height, the larger the pipe, the more the flow. Small pipe, big pipe. So you can see there that illustrated. Now, here's a question for you to think about. What if the existing water pipes to your home had no resistance to the flow of water? They do, They do, in fact, have resistance. Yeah. Um, but what if they had no resistance to the flow of water? And the answer to that question is to get the same flow that you do now with your pipes that do resist, there's one of two things you could do. One, you could put in smaller pipes using the same height of, of a tower, so the same pressure, or you could reduce the height of the tower, less pressure, and uh, use the same pipes that you have right now, and you would have the same flow. So either of those two things works, and that's kind of going to show us a bit about superconductivity. It comes down to a new paradigm in power flow, uh, back in the days when Edison and Westinghouse and Tesla were having arguments about um, the kind of power that we should get, whether it's DC or AC and that kind of thing, mm -hmm. what we found out or what Westinghouse found out is that by going to high voltage, you could have low current, relatively low current. And by having low current, the resistance of the wires, wires have resistance, you know, like your toaster is wires. You put a lot of current through it, it heats up and gets red. Well, the power that comes to your house over the wires, it's also heating up those wires, not enough so that they're red, but there's resistance there. And in order to reduce the resistance, Ohm's law says you reduce the current. But how do you get the same amount of power? you got to increase the voltage. And that's what that's right. our for 100 years now, almost, we've been having that kind of paradigm. Superconductivity changes it completely, turns it around. Now, what we have 
is low voltage and high current. Because why? Because superconductors don't resist the flow of electricity. Simply put, superconductivity is no resistance to the flow of energy. Now, in an can ordinary color. <laughs> yeah. can, I, can I add something, Steve? I'm an, yes. auto, I'm an auto electrician and build hot rods and work on cars. And yeah. I understand exactly how yeah. you're talking here about the electricity flow and the resistance and stuff. So, yes, yeah, superconductivity would even uh, advantage cars, anything, really? anything okay. electrical. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. It the, does. It turns, right. It, and it turns out that length of path comes into be economically a yes. big part of the picture. And we'll talk about that a little bit, too. So here what I'm showing, I'm going to show you two pictures. First of all, that picture, it looks, those, those little blue things with tails that look like tadpoles, those are uh, the electrons. It's, uh, imagining the electrons that are flowing in the wire. And you can see that they're kind of bouncing all over the place. They're random in terms of their motion. In a superconductor, yes. they all line up and march very right. nicely together. And because hey. they do that. Hey, Dave. Hey, Dave. we got been a while. Welcome. Thanks I'm for joining us. Okay. Welcome, Dave. Uh, because they march in order like that, they don't create resistance. Next slide then. Oops. Okay. So what we have is like the water flowing in pipes. It, no, I don't know what happened here. That's not going in the right. Okay. So like water flowing in the pipes, it takes pressure to overcome the resistance in the wires. As we said, mm -hmm. low resistance means lower voltage, smaller wires. Mm -hmm. Now that very complicated chart on the right, we're not going to get into the details, but if later you want to come back and look at it, what you will see there is a... Uh, a, a energy loss diagram that shows that by the time the power that's generated in the nuclear or whether it's solar power or wind power or nuclear or coal or gas generated at the generator, by the time it gets to your house, 10% is lost in the wow. transmission. Yes, that's true. Mm. Okay. And it's because of resistance. We got a question, you Steve. You ready? Reduce resistance, then you're going to save energy. Yes? All right, here we go. Dave says, do you want to read it? Go ahead. Maybe. Yes, there are high. The question is, aren't there high cooling costs? In fact, there are cooling costs. That is the gotcha, if you will. You've got to keep the conductors cold. In fact, for the current application we have now, it has to be about... 75 centigrade, uh, 75, 75 Kelvin, which amounts to minus 200 and something centigrade. Very yeah, cold, but not, not at all unachievable. Yeah. So there are costs to the cooling. What we're going to see, though, as we and what we've found out already is that in some applications, those costs are the in comparing to the co conventional alternating current. Um, and copper conductors, the superconductor is more cost effective than the conventional. Oh, wow. But that depends on, that's going to depend on the application. It's also going to depend on a number of research. Um, well, we come, we'll come later to what, what needs to happen in order for us to get into a fully commercial situation. We'll come to that at the end. But it, okay. but it does include the cost of the refrigeration. So that's a good point. Oh, Jeff has okay. a comment too. So, yeah, that's why we keep looking yes. for superconductors. Yeah, we keep looking for superconductors that work at higher temperatures. Exactly. Right. In fact, there's a very well known science fiction series by Larry Niven in which he has, he goes to a world, or his, his protagonist goes to a world that's basically a huge donut that's the size of the solar system. And inside this world, the power has been distributed by what he what he calls organic superconductors that work at room temperature. In his science fiction book, it turns out there's been a disease that has attacked the organic um, superconductors, and they're not working anymore. Oh but I no! Found that very interesting. This ties in with this comment. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, okay. but this ties in with this comment. I wanted you to see it. Okay. 
Yes, the superconductors, we'll come to that too. Let me come to that. We're going to come to all these things that superconductors are brittle. In fact, they're not wires at all. They're not metal. All right. As far as expensive to produce, we're going to cover that. And you'll see that later. We're going to talk a lot about that. So good, good cool. comments. Superconductors are brittle. Steve. They're not wires. And there is a cost issue and how you make them. Um, but that's back to Jeff's comment, back to Jeff's comment about higher temperature. Um, there have been some superconductors, you'll see news items from time to time, new superconductor found getting close to room temperature. But one of the gotchas that you're going to find out if you read closely is those superconductors that have been discovered that are close to room temperature are operating at very, very high pressures. I mean, hugely high pressures. They're completely impractical. For any kind of power application, I spoke. I had dinner with Alex Mueller, the Nobel Prize winner, for oh. the discovery of high-temperature superconductivity. Alex Mueller actually just recently died. I had dinner with him about mm, ten years ago, and I asked him about room-temperature superconductors. And he, it was very interesting. His comment, uh, he said that, and it was rather technical too. But he said basically, you'd have to get into something that was beyond something that had to do with the phonon interactions uh, and or, or something beyond that. He was kind of skeptical that it would happen. But then after all, he discovered something that by now is kind of an old technology. Well, Did you say phonon? What is yeah, that? Phonon. What is a, a phonon? phonon is like a photon, only it has to do with lattice vibrations. So in a crystal, a crystal made up, any kind of crystal, salt, uh, uh, yeah. any kind of uh, metal, even metallic crystals, they're they're in lattice structures. They're like um, yeah. geometric, like jungle gyms. And you see yes. different pictures, okay? And they vibrate. They vibrate with temperature. And the vibration emits energy. And the energy, according to a wave particle duality, is a phonon. can be thought of as a particle or a wave. And they're called phonons. Uh. But they're... It, now you reach, you've now reached the limit of my understanding of that because that's solid state physics and not my field. Uh, but that's what a phonon is. Thank you. Moving I didn't along. even know what that was. Yeah, I must say what? I've never heard of it. Yeah, I've thank you. That was great. Never heard of it, no. I, okay, I, let's I, move on. I'm get, no, getting where you're coming from, though. Yeah, yes. yeah. Oh, you want to – let me let me show the screen. Okay. There you go. So now, superconductivity is not new. It, in fact, it was discovered over 100 years ago by Kammerling's Onis, who's a um, Dutchman. I hope I got that right. He was investigating mercury, uh, mm. at, uh, and he, he cooled the mercury down, very, very cold, and it became superconducting. Um, wow. the, and that's when it was discovered. These and the, But it wasn't, mercury is not very practical, but by the middle of last century, well, maybe more like the 60s or 70s, um, we began to be able to make superconductors from metal alloys. And they operate at liquid helium temperatures, which is about four degrees, four kelvins, not, I shouldn't say degrees, four kelvins above absolute zero, or about okay. minus 450 degrees Fahrenheit. Very cold. Um, those superconductors are called low temperature superconductivity or low, low temperature superconductors. And we just use the acronym LTS. So you're going to see that LTS a little okay. bit. And cool. here's the two alloys that are currently used. Um, niobium titanium or niobium tin. Those are the two common ones. They operate in liquid helium, as I mentioned. Hmm. They're used every day. You've probably been inside of a, a, a low temperature superconducting device called an MRI yeah. machine. Oh, uh, yeah. If you've ever been an MRI, you have been very close to low temperature superconductors. They'd be only wow. just a few centimeters away from your head. Yes. Uh, they've been around for decades. Um, the uh, a very large um, a fusion reactor called ITER, International Thermal Nuclear uh, Experimental Reactor, ITER, being um, built right now in france it's a multi-nation thing it uses low temperature superconductors so why doesn't the mri feel cold when you're in it though oh, uh, because in order very simply because in order to keep it cold you have to insulate it so it's like in a vacuum bottle yeah so Got it. 
why does a hot why does a hot coffee in a vacuum not feel hot because it's in a yeah. vacuum? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That, it. by the way, going back to a question that was made earlier, that's part of the issue too. Is in order to keep them cold, you not only have to refrigerate them the liquid liquid nitrogen, but you have to insulate it vacuum wise to keep the the outside warm air from uh, boiling it away. So anyway, moving on. Um, so, but LTS is not, we, we, right away in the seventies, we said, okay, good. We've got Niobium titanium or Niobium tin. Maybe we can use this for trans for power cables, but it turned out that it was not economic. And so things kind of stagnated for about a deck, a little over a decade. But mm. then in 1986, there were new materials discovered. That was Alex wow. Miller was the one who discovered these, um, he worked for IBM in Germany, uh, the IBM Research Lab in Germany. Mm -hmm. He and his colleague discovered that in 1986. And their term, they are termed high temperature superconductivity or superconductors, HTS. And the reason, and so when you say high, well, it's not like high to warm your feet <laughs> or hands. But, but it's above 4 but Kelvin. <laughs> but, but, but relative, relative to heli uh, liquid helium, which is... Uh, much much colder this is where they're operating at liquid nitrogen, nitrogen. which is uh, uh they, they be, these these things become superconducting at about 77 kelvins instead of four kelvins yeah you, and it turned out that. what's that you would that notice that yeah you would notice that yes <laughs> yeah you would. now a couple of good things about this you may think well that's still pretty cold in fact you know high school it science they dip a banana in the liquid nitrogen. Well, actually yeah. even CO2, you can put it in liquid nitrogen and then crack it and it falls into a million pieces. So it's pretty, it's pretty nasty stuff if you put your hand in it, but it actually is, a, it's, a, it's a very good thing about it because it's very cheap to get. Liquid helium uh, is- There's liquid plenty of nitrogen. Very, what? There's plenty of nitrogen compared to helium for a start. Yeah. Yes, 78% yeah. yeah. of the atmosphere is nitrogen. So that's yes. right. And and, ah. and and you know why it's why it is so cheap? Mm -hmm. It's it's because there's a huge oh. market, there's a huge market for liquid oxygen. Yeah. Okay. And other rare gases like argon and neon, which are in the atmosphere. And yeah. so the plants that produce the liquid oxygen that and and stuff that's used in hospitals, the nitrogen is just a byproduct. Yeah. So oh, it's no kidding. Cheap. Hey, we got it's, another it's question very... for you. You ready? Yeah. Another question. Dave says, Stephen, scientists like you are, in essence, technically trained pragmatic people. People, sorry. Just curious, why the foray into sci-fi? Because I have an emotional, um, a, a dreamy, um, uh, outer space kind of uh, mentality. I like to think outside of the box. In fact, I have part, of, part of my career was... I have several patents to my name, and and some of them come because I was thinking outside of the box. My science fiction began as a retirement project, actually. When I retired, I uh, had two projects. One was to write science fiction. The other one is to get a master's degree in theology from a seminary. I got about halfway through the seminary and kind of ran out of steam, but that's sort of typical of the kind of things I do. The the science fiction books I've written have been a lot mostly from fun, although I really wish more people would 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 uh, get them, not because I'm trying to make any money, because it's not a money-making proposition. But, you know, if you create something that you've created nice and you like people to admire it. Um, yeah, true. Here, here I, write the kind of science, I write the kind of science fiction that I like to read, and so my science fiction is kind of old school. It's nice. sort of Star, Star Trek-y kind of stuff. Um, C.S. Hey. Lewis or, and the the um, the uh, originator of the Lord of the Rings and uh, Tolkien and C.S. Lewis were medieval. Um, ex, uh, they were scholars in in England in the early part of the 20th century, and they were classical people. and And the kind of literature that was around in the early part of the 20th century was definitely not the kind of stuff that they liked because they liked medieval uh, knights and shining armor and all this kind of stuff. And so they got together and decided they would just write books that, that, that they liked. And that's what I'm doing. I write books that I like.
Bravo, Excellent. yes, I just nice. bought all four of them. I just bought all four of them. I can't wait to dive in. I'm trying really hard not to read books in parallel anymore. I used to have uh, <laughs> I don't know, three to five going at once and trying to finish <laughs> one and then start the next one. So, okay, well, thanks It'll for that. Little bunny trail. Let's get back to super connectivity. Yes. Um, so, anyway, um, here's a picture. On the left there, you see uh, copper conductors, ordinary conventional yep. copper conductors. Those would be right. in an electrical transmission cable that yep. would be, they could, that would probably be an underground transmission cable. And you can tell how big they are by the finger that's there. Very the little, the little, the little tape like things on the right are the equivalent, they carry the equivalent amount of power. Wow. Those are wow. superconductors. And in fact, the only thing superconducting about them, I'll show you a picture in a minute, is the surface of them. It's not even the middle inside of them that's superconducting, just the surface. Me three. Question. <laughs> yeah, it was Dave was like, I like this guy. Jeff goes, me too. And Scott says, me three. And we got, uh, Dave came back with, do you foresee and practice yeah. any practical yeah. applications? For that is a, I love that question. Me and that's too. <laughs> you will find that in book number two of the series. We um, missed you, Dave. <laughs> you, and, and here's the application. And this, I think this is a very legitimate application. And I don't think I've ever seen anybody do this. In fact, I probably should try to patent the idea, I suppose, except we don't have space travel yet. You know, you probably know that outer space is not a very friendly environment. In fact, it's no. extremely hostile. Yes, um, uh, there well are known. high energy protons out there that will destroy yeah. human flesh very rapidly. Uh, in fact, it's high energy, high energy protons that create cosmic rays here on yeah. our planet. The high energy protons come and they hit the upper atmosphere and they create a cascade of yes. lower energy particles that are still quite uh, nasty. The protons have are charged uh, a proton is po positively charged yep. comes from stellar explosions that's that's and supernovas that's where they're all coming from and they're the the outer space is full of those and you have to you have to shield against those and then there's other stuff that comes from the sun and solar flare and stuff like that these are almost all of them are charged particles yes. so what you do is you surround your spaceship with a magnet okay with a magnetic oh, yes. field like the, earth. And, like the earth. and when the protons come toward the ship, it gets it gets repelled off. You have to design the magnet field appropriately. Now, that could be a very power consuming thing because it has to be a pretty high power magnifier or a large magnet. And maybe fuel is an issue out there in outer space. But if you have a magnet that is made of superconductors, which is what an MRI magnet is, by the way. It's superconductor. It's low temperature. But there are today all around the world in high to energy physics laboratories, magnets made with high temperature superconductors. It's one of the applications. I won't be covering it, but it is an application. They don't use very much power and they create high fields. So what you do. Plenty of vacuum you know, too. <laughs> now here's, here, okay, you got two things right away. Pam, you got the first one. You got vacuum. Yeah. Right. You also got coal. Not only you don't you have you got seventy seven Kelvin. You've got like two Kelvin. So I mean you are way down there. You don't even have to worry about insulating the thing. <laughs> so it's a great application, and I have that in my um, it's reference. It's not I, I don't go into it in detail, but in the in the star Star Chaser is the name of the ship in Copernicium. Um, and in book, book number, number two, two. Star, Star Chaser, and the, and it's an old school spacecraft that has a rotating ring. It was before the days of anti-gravity, this particular spaceship, but it's been retrofitted for things. And it does have uh, superconducting magnets that are deflecting protons from outside. So that's an application that's there. Yeah, Dave and came then, back. You ready? <laughs> okay. You know, ideas on superluminal speeds and God save us for warping space time. I'm a Star Wars tragic. <laughs> <laughs> like tragic, you mean uh, that you like Star Wars. Okay. What? Well, anyway, um, read my books because, okay, I'm let gonna... me ask, we're getting really <laughs> off the subject here, but um, Alcubierre, Miguel Alcubierre was a Star Trek 
he's a he's a, a, a Mexican astrophysicist, you know, the mm. kind of people that deal with Einstein's general relativity and star mm. star issues. I, I think he's still alive. Pretty sure he is. But back in the I suppose I think maybe back in the 80s, something like that. It's been a while. He's a Star Trek enthusiast, and you know they had and Roddenberry had come up with the term warping space, space you know warp drives, and so yeah. Miguel yeah. found himself wondering because he was an astrophysicist and dealing with space time things. He said, nice. "I wonder if it's possible to warp space." Nice. So guess what? It is. Yes. And he he solved. He set himself to solve Einstein's equations of general relativity for space to show that you could warp space the one gotcha is that you had to have negative mass you have negative matter we don't have anything like that but the current idea that the universe is expanding which is negative in causing by negative energy so presumably there is something called negative energy and negative ah. mass we just don't know how to harvest it if you okay. have an Al and so in my books i used an alcubierre drive. In fact, I call it an Alcubierre space drive. Nice. It, is, it comes in about book two or three. Um, it's called the Frankel Spinoza drive in book one. That's courtesy of my wife, Barbara, who is my muse and helps me with a lot of really cool ideas. And so we came up with this, but it has always been a an Alcubierre drive. And the interesting thing about warp, warping space, which I have a little bit of a problem with the way Star Trek does things, is you're not moving. You're not moving when you're in a warp drive. It's space that's moving, being compressed in front of you and yeah. expanded before you. And you kind of mess with your head, though. Okay. <laughs> what does that really and, mean? How does that work? It messes with my head. Well, it's, it, it's, 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 that's a negative mass. That negative mass allows you to compress space in front of okay. you. All right. Think about this. Think about you're a spaceship, a dot on a balloon, okay? And you want to get to the other side of the balloon. You could go around the surface of the balloon real fast, or what wormholes and these the people that uh, of that genre of science fiction they punch a hole through the through the balloon. Okay, that's maybe okay. But what the Kubieri drive does is it scrunches up the the rubber the balloon surface in front and 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 it stretches behind and so what happens is you scrunch up enough in front you get to where you want on the surface of the balloon without ever moving in wow this. so you're not moving you're not it's not super luminal you are not breaking einstein's um uh, yeah. the, the special relativity of not going faster than the speed of light you are not going faster than the speed of light Wait a lot, you're, not. you're not going at all practically so these, the space, these guys, the space is doing that okay? these guys are messing around in the chat <laughs> tapes like are you What's behaving? What's written on it? <laughs> oh, oh, Dave, yes. You remember this this T-shirt, mate. Yeah, yeah. And Jeff Dave, goes, Dave, no, he's not. Uh, Dave, Dave Renneke gave me this T-shirt. <laughs> oh, that's from, it's from Dave. Okay. It's from Dave. <laughs> anyway, Steve, please continue. Okay, let's get back to this now. Super connectivity. I'm, I'm having fun. I hope you are. Yeah, so, absolutely. Now I'm going to go into... Um, there's what okay we, we talked about the wire somebody wanted to know about the wire so here's what you'd have you uh there are two kinds of of well there's actually three but the first two that have been developed so far um the acronyms for them are bisco and rebco and but i give you the the actual chemical the, they're alloys but they're they are ceramic alloys they are ceramics they're ah. ah. okay the bisco Bronte, bismuth, strontium, calcium, copper oxide was the one that was first discovered. And so it's called first generation. And then a later discovery, just a few years later, um, using yttrium, which is the Y, or RE just stands for any, well, not any rare earth, but certain rare earths. Yeah, Lanthanum is another one. Um, so you have rare earth, barium, copper oxide. So we call it Rebco. And that's second generation. Now, here's what they look like. This is an end on picture. Like if you remember those little, uh, those filaments that I showed you next to the copper, um, big pieces of copper wire, the little filaments, this is looking into the end of one of those. And this shows you the how the wire is actually made. And I'm gonna show you a picture in a minute that builds it up. But what you see is in the middle there is uh, the little, the gray things. Those are the, um, the HTS 
superconducting filaments, and they are embedded in silver, which wow. makes it a very, it makes it a fairly expensive wire. Um, yeah. So people were not too happy with that because silver is very expensive. So they went to they looked around more, and now we have something called the Rebco, which is built a little differently, and there's no very little silver involved. And I'm going to show you in a minute a, a little bit better picture of how that's put together. But in, first of all, let's talk about one other wire type. It's called magnesium diboride, MGB2. <laughs> it was discovered, um, well, it's been about 20 years now, I think. In fact, I think it was just, we just had the anniversary, the 20, 20 wow. of, of it. Um, and it's been under development. It is not technically a high temperature superconductor. It becomes wow. superconductor at less than 39 kelvins. So you don't have to have liquid helium. You can do. You can use liquid neon or liquid hydrogen, ah. or maybe something else. But which is is it's still expensive. So the cost for cooling is exponentially. The colder you get, the cost ah. goes up exponentially. Oh, it's not linear. True. It's, it's a very small yeah. exponential. And so you. That's why liquid nitrogen is so so attractive and you get start going below liquid nitrogen you're starting to drive the cost up yeah the offsetting thing here is that mgb2 the wire is 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 very very inexpensive and we'll talk about i'll give uh, you a number in it so we, we got some so comments piling up hang on, hang on steve we got some comments piling up uh i think okay. this is the first time kenneth is here welcome thanks so much for joining us kenneth goes to you dr miguel alcuberry alcuberry is an amazing a cool area, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, amazing person, great theoretical physicist. And Daniel says, it's okay for space to break the speed of light because it has zero mass. Yes. <laughs> Dave is laughing. And Dave comes back with, Steve enlighten me on underground transmission re regarding superconductivity. I'm not sure of this distinction. Okay, we're gonna. I'm gonna give you a lot of pictures of underground transmission, but right. basically the, the question is: there, it's not either or. Um, mm. The um, superconducting, superconduct, superconducting cables are underground cables by just the virtue of the fact that you have to have a vacuum sheath. Yeah. yeah. Think of a think of a long vacuum bottle. Right. Yep. Yeah. So you can, I mean, Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico a few years ago did make one overhead line, but it, that's very impractical. It just does not work. So you're going to go underground because you have this nice, and also I'm going to show you pictures of how, what these look like. So that's they right. are underground cables just by practical means. There are conventional cables for 100 years that are underground. Any city, any major city, you don't see any wires there overhead. There, all the power is underground. And in fact, I'm going to show you a picture of what that looks like too in a little while. So it's not superconducting or underground. It's like underground superconducting or underground conventional. Those are the that's the two wow. things. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, we got one more. Boron is a metalloid, so a good okay. choice. Okay. Yeah. So it's mm -hmm. conducting. Okay. It conducts electricity because it's a metalloid. Yeah, That's a good idea. Hmm. Well, there's lots of anecdotes actually. MGB2 is actually well, I won't get into it. That's a real bunny trail, and it, it gets, <laughs> that gets beyond my ability to explain anyway. So let's move on, Pam. Sure. Okay, so next thing. Oh, okay, we're talking about cost. Um, I want to, I want to say there was a question about cost. So here's what we here's what we know about cost. First of all, you have to understand, or it's important to notice that the way we talk about cost for superconducting wire is a, a unit called dollars per kiloamp meter. Mm. And what that means is if you have one meter of wire that can carry one kiloamp, 1,000 amps, um, okay. and it, it say it costs $10. Now, one meter of wire that can carry a kiloamp, it costs you $10. That would be called $10 per kiloamp meter. So we talk about, we use this, and I'll show you, go back to the slide and we'll show you why. Okay. It's because, first of all, the type of wire determines various things. First of all, the type of wire determine, determines the ampacity, which is how much current it can carry. 
Secondly, the so copper is one thing, superconductors is another, aluminum is another. They all have different ampacities, current carrying capability. Uh -huh. Secondly, the costs for both materials and manufacturing are determined by the type of wire. And then finally, the auxiliaries and the installation costs, like the refrigerator, for example. So yeah. we found that the dollar per kiloamp meter is a good way of comparing one type of wire with another, as well as comparing any superconducting wire with copper. And I'm going to show you that next. So for the Bisco right now, today, probably around $100 per kiloamp meter. That means a wire that's um, a meter long that carries a thousand amps costs a hundred dollars the next one rebco today is probably around two hundred dollars a kiloamp meter wow. but uh, you notice i say at high production volumes it could get down maybe pushing a little bit down to, studies have been done to show it could get down to five dollars wow but who knows you we used to say by 2030 i don't know if that's going to happen and why is that? Uh, the 100 for Bisco, that's the limit because silver, remember, there's a lot of silver there. You just can't get below the price of silver. And silver, Rebco, and silver is consumable. Unlike gold, which you can recycle, you can consume well, silver. So. Yeah, but it's a precious metal. Rebco, yeah. the, the second generation, doesn't use uh, expensive materials. Its problem is the production machinery to ah. make it. And... Wow. And it's it's high costly, but the pro the thing is, once you've built the factory, the more you run through it, the cheaper it gets. And yeah. so that's what you've seen. That number is high volumes of production. So moving so on, first, the first, up, first up costs would be extreme, and then over a few years, yeah. the cost would gradually <laughs> decrease, just because that's what we're that's building exactly the infrastructure right. to, to, to get yeah. it going that's what we're seeing today. And yeah. the comments are backing well, up again. You got a second? Got a second. <laughs> We got more comments. In one of my tongue-in-cheek moments, I wonder if some sneaky Americans are working on advanced superconductivity over there at good old Area, Area 51. 51. Dave. Of course, uh, Jeff was like, no, Dave. <laughs> no, They're Dave. doing it in Area 52. <laughs> Everybody's looking at 51. <laughs> and Daniel has, is there a cost threshold that could make load balancing an interconnected day side night side whole earth power grid hmm. oh i love that question you know yeah. that's my vision at the end of the presentation we're going to come to that um i don't show the picture of this but one of my japanese colleagues that whose name was hata he had a vision it's called the genesis vision i don't know how he came up with that name but he's got superconducting direct current not alternating current direct current superconducting wires in, uh, in hmm. girdling the planet with solar power plants in places where you can get a lot of good solar energy, like the Sahara. So yes, but on a more local basis, uh, who is it asked the question? Was it Dave? Um, uh, Daniel. Daniel. There Daniel. It is. Okay, Daniel. On a more local basis, even going from the west coast to the east coast, and that's where the, I'm going to show you the, the kind of the vision that at the end of the presentation we have looked at that and you can even do stuff going across three or four time zones because after all wow. peak energy use in the east coast at eight o'clock at night is yeah. not so much here in the west coast so you can right. shift right. power the thing is you got to have a nice low cost economical way to do it and i'm going to tell you about a low cost economical way to do that as we get further into this right so on. all right so let's push on here. Next one, Dan. We I said they had the chicken and the egg, um, <laughs> the because the manufacturing versus the sales volume. And so we're in a situation where, well, right now the situation is that there are applications, great applications for superconductivity, including the one we were just talking about. But the cost is too high. To get the cost down, you have to make a lot of the wire. But you yeah. can't make a lot of the wire because the cost is too high. So it's a chicken and egg. Yes. And the U.S. government and other governments in the world have uh, made attempts to, and we'll talk about that a little bit uh, later too, but it, re it really does require help in the form of, um, in my opinion, from government uh, support. Uh, we'll mm. talk about that in a minute. Now, finally, we get to MGB2. Look at the number there. Only a dollar, and that's today. Today's cost, a dollar wow. to two dollars a kilowatt meter. 
But, 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 the cost of the cryogenic cooling system is ah. really high. And yeah. to date, I wanted to have somebody do this. I don't think it's been, been done yet. Uh, when I was, I spot in my career, I was a sponsor of research. I worked for a company that sponsored research. And I always wanted somebody to do a study that would do a cost study. Um, of this, and I don't think it's ever been done. Because you have to do a trade, you have to do trade-off studies. You start looking yep. at the lower cost of the conductor, the higher cost of the refrigeration, so on and so forth. Right now, today, there are people who believe that that it's a go, particularly for DC cables. The Europeans have a have a project they just completed on that. So I don't have much more to say about that, but I did want to include that. So final final point on this slide is the comparison to copper. So there you see it, copper. And this was uh, this I did this a few years ago, oh, and copper, of course, varies in price. Yeah. And I don't yeah. remember the price. I think I used it was three dollars a ton $3 or something. A About uh, okay. I forget the number. I could look it up, but I used the 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 the, co the cost of copper in doing this came up with sixty dollars a kilowatt meter. But that's a round number. So you can see that right now. Copper is less expensive, except for the MGB2 situation, which we don't really know because of the costs of the cooling. Right. But if you could look back at just the copper itself is cheaper. And the, the numbers that I'm showing up there for Bisco and Rebco, those are for the conductor only. That does not include the cooling system. So you can see they are not cost effective. Yeah. But if we can get to the high production volumes, it gets down to $5 or even $50 a kilowatt meter. Now wow. we're going to start to get... Something, but that's that. That is the 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 thing that with the struggle that we're dealing with right now today. But there are people moving on. And one of the one of the big promising things right now in this area is fusion, fusion reactors that use HTS conductors because they're going to use a lot of it. And there are fusion token uh, fusion magnets all all over the world today there's two or three in the u.s there's a couple in the uk i think there's one in germany i saw the um i think in china and in japan they're all so everybody's getting into fusion now using the high temperature superconductors for the magnets wow. remember i told you about the large eater that that's being built today that's low temperature it's huge it's, it's a monstrous thing and it, it'll never be commercial um and in, in fact, that isn't planned to be commercial. It's just supposed to be a demonstration. But the, the fusion reactors using high temperature, you could fit one in your living room practically. They're small. Wow. So anyway, so, uh, I've got a yeah, question there. Yeah, Dave. Um, predicting the exact timeline for widespread practical use is challenging. Yes, it is. Is ongoing research and investment are driving progress in this field? Yes, it is. And Here, here's, a follow -on. here's a follow-on. I refer to, in general, to superconductors. Yeah, there is on, and we'll talk. We're, I'm going to show you what's going on on that. So let's move on. And I love our crowd. Okay, they, we okay, crowd for all the time pound. here. Yeah, four. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Daniel, for that. It was $3 a pound, was the I knew it was three something. It's $3 a pound I used for that 60. So right now you'd have to, to ramp that 60 up a little bit. Yeah. Good. Thanks for looking that up. Good point. Okay, moving on. Um, we're going to talk about present reality and future vision. And this is just Steve Eckrode's quote. By the year 2050, superconductivity will be will significantly alter the North American electricity landscape. I still stand by that prediction. However, well, you know, we'll see. Next slide. Um, so where are we today for power applications? Uh, there's the date they was discovered, but by the by within about two and a half decades or about two decades, yeah, nine, six, two and a half decades by the 2010, there were prototype devices employing HTS in almost every area. We got underground cables, transformers, fault current limiters, synchronous condensers, generators, motors, and energy storage. So all of those have been demonstrated uh, at one level or another. Um, most of them are demonstration. In some cases, there are commercial projects, particularly in the area of fault current limiters, uh, and in a couple of cases, the underground cables. Transformers turned out to be a bit of a disappointment. I mean, they are more efficient, and they do they are less less space. Um, they take less space, but they they don't look too economically attractive, um, and 
I won't go in. I this is a lot of stuff here, and I'm going to focus on mostly on underground cables. But I just wanted to tell you that there's a lot of stuff going on. At the right, there is a picture of one of the first demonstrations oh. in the U.S. We'll come to that in a minute. Wow. Um, okay, so why? The question is, why do we want to use HTS for power cables? And we already talked about the efficiency and the power savings due to low losses. But there's some other reasons as well. And a big one is the power density. Um, and you might not think this is a big deal, but it is a big deal if you compare the two pictures here. First of all, on the left, you have that the large block with the nine cables. Those are conventional copper cables. Okay. The same amount of 27 copper cables, one, what's called, it's a type of, of superconducting cable called a triaxial cable. One of those operating at 13 kilovolts and 69 MVA can handle the same amount of power is as in those nine cables. Now, wow. why is that? Why is that cool? Um, because there's a picture somebody dug up. That's a street in New York City. Ta a photograph taken about <laughs> 20 years ago. Wow. That's what. That's what's under the streets of mo most major cities in the world. Wow. Chicago, wow. New York, and those are water lines, power lines, wow. telephone lines. You name it. There are all kinds of utilities in the area. So if you wanted to put a new cable down that street, you're really fighting a lot of stuff that's already there. So right away, something that's smaller is very attractive. Yes. But there's an even better cool thing about this. Underground cables like the copper ones there, they generate heat. Okay. Oh. And that heat has, right? And that heat has to be removed. And so in order to keep them from heating up, you have to install them close to the surface. Well, mm. by close, I mean like a couple of meter, a meter or two below ground, but relatively close. And not only that, you have to cover them with a very special kind of backfill. You can't just dump the dirt back on. You have to use engineered materials that go back, leading huh. to very high construction costs. A superconducting cable, because it carries its temperature envelope with it, can go anywhere. It can go deep, around, anywhere you want. You don't have any problems like that. So these are some other reasons why superconducting power cables underground are attractive compared to the copper cables. So that even though they are more expensive in terms of materials, there are benefits associated with, in some cases, are even hard to economically um, take care of, uh, accommodate. Sorry. So let's go on. Uh, hang on, we got a couple more comments. We got we got more comments. Okay. <laughs> There's a lively crowd tonight. I love mm, it. Uh, I agree with Bucky Fuller that the kilowatt hour should be a standard global currency. Current. <laughs> Cute. Okay. And Dave Dave says so besides the good old USA, are any progressive programs being carried out in any other country? Oh, what a great segue! You're going to get plenty on that in just a few <laughs> minutes. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. So first of all. So first of all, here's here's a little study. I actually did this today. Um, I used the, the numbers here. Th this based on a real. Uh, this, this this is based on a study done by a cable manufacturer. Uh, in fact, it's a it's a manufacturer. It's a uh, uh, international. It's large manufacturer that manufactures both kinds of cables. They manufacture conventional copper cables, XLPE is the acronym for cross-link polyethylene, which is the standard conventional copper cable that's put in today oh. underground, XLPE. This manufacturer makes those, and they also make an HTS cable, all right? What I've done with their numbers, which were proprietary and so on, I have not used them here. I normalized them to one. So you don't, those are not dollars there. Those are normalized. So I normalize cost to one. So the XLPE cable is one and the superconducting HTS cable is, you can see almost half the cost of a conventional yeah. copper cable. And that's with, that's with today's, or that's with the amount of superconductor that would be needed for a one kilometer long cable, which isn't very long, less than a mile. And, and, and you're going to see some, I'm going to show you some demonstrations and projects in the world that are that length and even longer. So that's a very real possibility, a one kilometer cable. Um, 
And, and this manufacturer has shown that in their, from their manufacturing point of view, and you, you know, go back to that chart for a minute. Let me point out one important, a couple important things. Notice the colors there that uh, look at the big, the big number for the XLPE is land purchase. And now from what I just told you before, you can see why you've got issues. Sometimes you can't go down that crowded street. So you know what you have to do? You have to go around the block. So that means you're going longer. So you got land purchase there. And um, then you've got the um, the right of way construction, which is that green at the top. So those two numbers are driving the whole cost of the copper. But those two numbers, land and right of way, are almost, uh, in, you can't see them. But the big cost for the superconducting is, guess what? The material, like we talked about before. Yeah. It's the blue number. So there you can uh, see. Okay, moving on. <laughs> Could I ask you a question? Yeah. yeah. Um, in Australia, um, most of the transmission lines and a lot of a lot of those power cables and stuff, we use aluminium. Oh. Yes. Yes. Well, because, wow. fact, because a and the, we've got the fact we call it aluminium. Aluminium. But, aluminium uh, is. Aluminium. <laughs> uh, yeah. We, we my, make most British. Of yeah. My British colleagues always call it aluminium too. Of course, yeah. that's the way. Aluminum, it's just, you know, just like any Americans. The other thing that ends in N-U-M. But Americans decided to be different, I guess, and called it aluminum. Yeah. aluminum. Anyway, Cliff, uh, most uh, most overhead cables today are aluminum or aluminum. Yeah. Um, really? But there yeah. are places there are places where copper is still used as well. That's surprising. It kind of depends on the application. Yeah, I was wondering that because I I do notice that um, I've seen them cut major power cables in, in cities yes. and they are using aluminium cables um, basically even underground so um, yes. uh, safer than your walls because that's yeah. something you catch on fire yeah. uh, and JD uh, Becker's got a question too uh, so uh, how does the heat of underground it probably the answer so does the heat of underground cables and pipelines impact asphalt roadway potholes <laughs> <laughs> that's a great question <laughs> um I've never, I've never heard of that, but um, it, it's possible, I suppose. Uh, it, I mean, it, the heat is coming out. They, one of the things that they have to worry about, I don't know why they, I thought of this, but the utility company has to be careful um, about running a cable too close to a tree because the roots of the tree, over the as they grow more and more, they're extracting moisture from the soil, and the cable yeah. can get hot in that region. And, ah. the, and it's the hot region of the, it's that limits the flow in a conventional cable. So ah. that's sort of that point was brought to mind by your question, but I don't know about potholes. <laughs> so interesting point. Well, uh, if you've got to dig up the road to put the cable in, then that weakens the road and then probably would make potholes yep. later. Mm. Yep. <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> right. Exactly. Okay, moving on then. Uh, where are we? Okay, so I'm going to show you how the wire is built. So um, look at this closely. We start out with, uh, now notice, first of all, that this whole thickness here is a tenth of a millimeter. That's how, wow. that's the yellow arrow on the right. So this is something very, very small. And these are layers there. There is 20 micro, micrometers of copper, then a 50 micrometer Hastelloy substrate, and then some very nanometer things of, uh, of these are various layers, uh, magnesium, di magnesium oxide and lanthanum magnesium oxide, I think, before you get to the HTS, which is the one micrometer. And then you cover it with a little bit of silver, two micrometers, and then another 20 uh, uh, micrometers of copper. That's how that wire for the Rebco wire that I looked, wow. we showed you a picture. Um, now, next step no, is no wonder how it's so make... complicated to make. Yeah. No wonder it's yes, so it complicated to make. Exactly. Uh, there are different ways of making it. Um, there's a vapor deposition method. There's also an electro electrochemical a bath type yeah. of, of making it. And there's even other methods. And different companies across the world have different techniques that are prior that they've invented to do this. Um, so they are difficult to make they, and go back to a comment earlier about they are that that um, the copper, of course, is metallic. So it's bendable. But the stuff inside of that, th those are ceramics and they yeah. 
you you can only bend them so much because if you bend them too much, they lose their superconductivity. So there's issues there. Now, how do we? Welcome to the, Thomas uh, say? Uh, Hunless nanometers, but yeah, very thin. Yeah, the the nanometers for the uh, for the preparatory layers. Then you've got um, uh, micro micrometers for HS. Yes, good point. Okay, so how do you make a wire? Uh, how do you get to a cable? So you got to have a long wire, and then what you do is you you do stuff like what you see here. You do helical windings around. Ah, right. Okay. Oh, and that's that way good. you can make something that's bendable. Okay, yes. moving on. Superconducting cables today, there are three kinds. Wow. Pretty much. The way they're constructed. Um, they're, they're, you, first of all, these are all, these are, these are alternating current cables, AC yeah. current. So you have oh. to have generally three phases in, in, a, in a high power yeah. uh, application. So the wires that go down your streets, those are, generally three phases, but you only get two coming to your house. But anyway, so you're going to have three wires. So the one in the upper right has has the three phases inside of one vacuum bottle. So the outer thing around that is the vacuum uh, wow. container. And the liquid nitrogen flows along the cables there that you see. Uh, on the left is a single one. And a single phase and all three of those have to go into a much larger container. That one is used for much higher power applications. The one on the right can go up to, well, I think those have been used up to maybe a hundred kilovolts or more. The one on the bottom is the triaxial cable. And that's the one that's being used in a lot of places today because it's good for up to about 70 kilovolts. And there's reasons, which I'll be coming to later, why that's a pretty good voltage. Um, if you remember that chart I showed you before where I compared the costs. Yeah. If, if, if um, I don't want to try to go back, but remember the, the conventional copper cable was 140, I think it was 145 kilovolts. I think that was the number used. And the Superconducting cable was 23 kilovolts. Remember back in the beginning, I talked about the high, the, the, the water tower high and yeah. then low. So you go low, 23 kilovolts, but because the wire is, is no resistance, you can carry a lot more current. Right. Power is voltage times current. Okay. So pressure times, times flow gives you power. So the superconducting cable was only 23 kilovolts but it carried much more current, and so therefore it had the same amount of power. That reaps you, by the way, big benefits in substations. Whenever you see utility substations with all the mm -hmm. wires and transformers, that's the reason those are so big is because those the wire, the insulation to the high voltage, very thousands of uh, hundreds of kilovolts, you have air to insulate. You can't compact them together. If you go on to, go back to the slide again, Pam, yep. you'll see that in the upper, um, left hand one you can see that there are layers of insulation in there and um, an under any underground cable has to have enough insulation to handle the voltage difference from ground yep. to the high voltage conductor in a superconductor cable that's much less onerous than it is in a conventional cable a triaxial cable as the one on the bottom uses all three phases in one cable and it's an ingenious dimension, and it's really a very popular cable today. I don't want to go into that in more detail unless there's a question, but let's move on. Um, okay. As is true of many things, sad, and this is, um, I hope I don't get too political here. The U.S. was the first in the world to introduce HTS cables. Hmm. More than 20 years ago, 30 years ago, the U.S. government started looking at this. Um, and... Um, we put in the first cables in, in the world. And here they were. There were four demonstration projects sponsored by the U.S. Department of Energy. The one in Columbus. The first one was the uh, one in, in uh, Albany, New York, or in Carrollton, Georgia. You can see a picture of it there. Then there was one and that was, um, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Excuse me. Um, go back, go back. Um, okay, I'm fine. Um, <clears throat> Then you have the one in Albany, New York, that was um, 
34 kV, 34 kilovolts. The one in Holbrook, New York was, or the one in Columbus, Ohio was 12 kilovolts. That uses the triaxial cable that I just showed you a picture of. And then the one in Holbrook, New York, out on Long Island, that used the the cable that was on the upper left-hand corner. That's the one big one. You put three yeah. together, right. and you can see the three of them there. They're, each of them have their own vacuum bottle that they're mm. that they're in. So you can see that that one with that's the Holbrook one has got three separate vacuum bottles versus the triaxial cable and the other one that has all three in one. You only have one vacuum bottle. So right away, you're saving money there. But you, in order to go to the very high voltages that you had in the, the one on Long Island, you had to go to the larger cable. So anyway, that was the situation 20 years ago, and today none of them remains. Oh, wow. And why don't they, why don't they remain? Because the U.S. government pulled the plug on the further demonstrations of them. Uh, AEP in Columbus wanted to continue that their cable, and they would have. All they had to do was have... The U.S. government pick up the maintenance, the ongoing maintenance costs of the cable, but the government wouldn't do that because there were people within the government who were advising the government that said that the technology was mature, a real mistake, because although it was mature in the sense that, yes, we could build a cable, yes, we could make the wire, <laughs> but the point is it was still too expensive for a utility company which after all has a mandate to serve and they can't just go investing in crazy technologies that cost 10 times more than something that they can do for 10 times cheaper and so you have to be able to cross that so-called valley of death and that's where government <laughs> support comes in and in its infinite wisdom, the U.S. government said that that wasn't necessary and that the commercial companies, the utility companies in America and the people making the cables and the wires should put up the money to make it happen. Well, they haven't. And so today there are none. There are no power cable that are in, in the grid. I'm going to show you one that is currently being uh, handled by the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, and it may turn into a real commercial application. But compared to the rest of the world, which we're going to come to next, I think, we're way back. Okay, first of all, at the same time, that, or just shortly after the U.S. put its those, we had a number of cable projects in the world. I'm not going to go into these. Um, Japan was pretty quick to pick one up, and, the, and in China there was one, and in Korea there were some. But just to show you that, again, about 20 years ago, um, there was some international activity, but not nearly as robust as the American activity. Our activity was much more robust. Um, today, right now today, if you study this chart, you can see that the U.S. does have a very uh, extensive program of development activities, but you will search in vain on that chart for power cables. And yet power cables are the one application, except for maybe fusion magnets, they're the one application that require miles and miles of wire. Now, by now, you should know why miles and miles of wire is important. Because miles and miles of wire transports to high volume production, which translates to low costs. Ah, ah yes. Got it. Magnets. MRI magnets, uh, all this other stuff here, they use superconductors, but they don't use a lot for any given application. A cable, yeah. by virtue of the fact that it goes for hundreds, can go for hundreds of miles maybe, uses yeah. a lot of wire. Mm. And so there, that is the application which has the most possible benefit for bringing costs down, if we can just come through that. Right, right. But now yeah. you're, you're talking to a cable engineer. That was my background when I before I retired. It was underground transmission. So that's my my um, um, expertise. Bias there. Okay, yeah. so how marvelous! Here's a map of the cable projects worldwide, past and present. And what you see that along the x-axis is the power that was transmitted that that the cable could transmit, and on the um, the uh, the x the x the y axis there you can see the um uh the length of the cable so you can see the anywhere from 10 meters up to about a kilometer or even more much longer several a uh, few tens of kilometers in some cases the four the the yellow things i've highlighted in yellow those are those four projects that i told you that us and that they are no longer in existence mm -hmm. but those were among those so there are past ones here and the next one is 
here's the one project in the U.S. that is, and I, I'm going to I'm going to give you details on it. It's taking place in the city of Chicago. That is in the U.S. Studying this chart, you'll see a lot of stuff. Some of it's past. You can tell from the years. Some of it's future. So I'm going to move on from here. Okay, so I'm going to go through a number of projects that are AC, AC cables first, and then a little bit on DC cables. Um, there's a project that just uh, finished recently. It was at a um, chemistry, a chemical plant, private chemical plant in Japan, um, called the Totsuka Project. Um, their whole point was to show that HGS cables could contribute to a decarbonized society, and they showed that. The power transmission losses were reduced by 95% compared wow. to conventional cables. It's a chemical plant that uses a lot of electricity. You can see there, 30 megawatts is a lot of electricity. Since in your home, you only use about five kilowatts. So it's a very high power plant. It was a 200 meter cable, triaxial. It was a one year demonstration and they confirmed the reduction in CO2 emissions. And the pictures that you see there, the one on the lower left is the termination of the cable. You, when you come to the end of the cable, you've got to go from, you got to go go from three things. You got to go from high voltage. In this case, it was um, maybe, I think it was um, 23 kilovolts, I believe, um, at, to, to ground. So you have to have to have something that can stand off that much voltage. You have to go from vacuum to atmosphere and you have to go from liquid nitrogen temperatures to room temperatures so it's a very complex piece of equipment called a termination and you can see uh, how complex it is there the middle picture shows some of the cable going up and bending around the corner of the building and then the upper right hand corner shows the cryogenic system and there are different ways of doing cryogenics but most many of the projects today use a tank of liquid nitrogen and that, and then they have a they pump on it to get it a little bit colder, uh, so that it works better. And then they circulate it through the the vacuum envelope or the the vacuum bottle envelope. Um, the reason that's done is because it's so easy to get liquid nitrogen in most industrialized countries anyway, and it comes in trucks. And so most economic studies show, or many of them show that it's better to just buy the liquid nitrogen and let it boil off uh, yeah. than it is to, to to actually use a closed loop refrigeration, which wow. is the other way of doing it. Uh, so next slide shows um, three projects. Um, they're ongoing today, all three of them. Not uh, There's one in Germany, one in, um, in Korea, and one in China. There's some others, but these are three that I kind of picked. Um, they're, they're, you can see when they started, um, the first of those and the most, the sort of the, the poster child of commercial applications for AC cables is the Essen Germany cable. I've been there. I have walked that route that's shown in the red in the upper right. Wow. It's about, it's about a kilometer long, um, very pretty city, Essen Germany, uh, North, uh, Northern Germany. Um, it's a 10 kilovolt, 40 megawatt cable and what's happening is there is that in the lower right you have a high voltage substation i believe 110 kilovolts and in the upper upper right you have a, an urban substation that has a growing or has suburban load there and it used to be fed or it was going to be fed by a 110 kilovolt cable following sort of that route would have been underground um, but they instead put in a 12 or 10 kilovolt cable that can handle the same amount of power because of the higher current. And so that, and that's currently still operating today. The uh, utility company, which is RWE, they originally were very, very bullish on putting in a lot more cables. They've kind of backed away a little bit, but they've kept this cable in operation. And I think they're still looking at applications elsewhere in Germany where they have service. The Shingal project in, in South Korea is a very uh, attractive project. It, 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 it's an application that's becoming very common for uh, superconducting cables where you interconnect two suburban substations at the low voltage side of the substation. Huh. In, in, any, in any utility substation, you've got a transformer that takes the high voltage 
overhead lines or underground lines and drops it down to a usable voltage on the right. secondary side. And um, if you, if you, generally you, you can extend the amount of service area of one substation to another area if you interconnect them. If, but if you interconnect them at the high voltage side, you, you might as well not bother because you got a high voltage line going to the other one. But if you try to interconnect them at the low voltage side, the current in ordinary copper is so high that it's prohibitive. The size of the copper conductor and the cost just doesn't make sense. But a low voltage, relatively low voltage, uh, superconducting cable makes a lot of sense. And so they're showing that. In particular, this the 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 Korean government and the 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 one the, the utility in Korea is Korean Electric Power Company. There's only one utility, and it's wow. partly owned by the government, which explains why, by the way, you get a lot of government support. And the Koreans probably are ahead of everybody else in the world right now oh, in wow. terms of superconducting cable. They're a very aggressive program, and they're doing a lot of really good stuff. Um, they what they have is they're looking at at bringing low voltage when i say low i mean like 20 23 kilovolts instead of 154 kilovolts right into downtown areas right wow. now what they have is 100 154 kilovolts going downtown so what they're doing is they're going to change that out and put in the lower voltage under under underground that means smaller substations downtown which means less land area it means transformers that are in substations are filled with oil Oil is combustible and can blow up and burn. Smaller yep. transformers, there's less oil, less chance of damage there. So there's a lot of good reasons there. So um, that's that project. And then the last one there on the bottom is the Shanghai project. Um, just started. It's a 35 kilovolt cable. Um, and it's connecting also um, to stations that are in the business district. Um, and they're looking at the benefits of doing that uh, for very similar reasons. Moving on, because I don't want to spend. Okay, here's a little more on the Essen project. Here's how. Here's some pro, Here's some pictures on how it was um, um, built. We got a comment here. Many thanks. Information source you to yourself a superconductor. <laughs> okay, thanks, Dave. So first of all, here's the cable being loaded at the factory on a spool. Next, uh, it's delivered to the site. Next, it, at night, they're generally at night because the traffic is less, they're installing it. It goes in a trench, just like normal underground transmission cables. And then here's a picture of the tank, the nitrogen tank that was being uh, installed. Um, the, the Shingal project, there's some diagrams. Um, I'm not, I've already talked about this pretty much. You can see the high voltage uh, on the left-hand side there, upper left corner, you see the high voltage in the in the current situation and then on the right with the little arrow going to the right you can see that they stop the high voltage outside of the business district and switch down to a low voltage which is the thinner line there and you can see the two pictures on the bottom in the bottom left shows you a lot of overhead lines and the bottom yeah. right there's nothing there very nice okay um, now here's the one project in the u.s it's, the, it's called the Resilient Electric Grid Project. It's sponsored by the Department of Homeland Security. It's a 3,000 amp, 12 kilovolt triaxial cable. Originally, the project was to interconnect five different substations in downtown Chicago. I've been there as well. I've seen the substations and seen why they need to do that. What, uh, what they want to do in this case now is a little different. It's not... It's not this idea of going to low voltage from a higher, higher outside, higher voltage to a low voltage to mm -hmm. reduce impact. This is, has to do with improving the reliability. In cities like Chicago and New York in particular, and Tokyo and London and Paris are the same, they have more than one substation than, than is necessary. If you have one more than is necessary, that's called N minus one. If you have two, that are not needed, that are there, but not needed, that's N minus two. N minus three would be three. So if you lose one of the transformers, you've got a spare there, that's N minus one. Currently, the substations in downtown Chicago, most of them are N minus one, some of them are N minus two. The purpose of this project is to do the following. You got two substations, both of them have one extra transformer. Now, 
if you want to have n minus 2, you can put in another transformer here. Okay. I'm not, this is funny. My hands are doing uh, because of the backwards mirror effect. You put in you put in an extra transformer here, and you'd have to put in an extra transformer here so that both of them would have n minus 2, right? But with a superconducting cable interconnecting this one, the one that has the extra transformer can serve the one that doesn't. Wow. Because they're interconnected at a at the low voltage side, the hmm. odds of losing a transformer in both substations at the same time are quite low. So you've actually saved the cost of a transformer, the size of it, everything, and you've achieved the higher reliability by fewer wow. by a lower. Reliability. And that's a very very attractive application. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, again, because of lack of government support in the U.S. That project has almost died, but they actually did end up putting a 200 meter cable on test. And I got a picture of that if you go to the next slide. Yep. Um, so there's an over, this is a, a, a overhead view. That's a substation that has two different parts to it. And they have interconnected two different pieces of it with a 200 meter cable. And that's currently operating today. But it really is more of a test situation than it is the real the real McCoy, although it is doing the same kind of thing. But hopefully that will morph into the original idea, which is to have several substations interconnected. Okay, so, we got another comment. You ready? Are there any superconducting cable demo projects yet in the in the greater than 100 kilovolt extra high voltage range typically used in the grid? Would superconducting economics be better by scaling economies of scale? Well, first of all, remember that remember the paradigm I said that when you go to superconducting, you shift the paradigm. In order to in the Westinghouse um, alternating current realm to get more power, you go to higher voltage. In a superconducting realm, you go to higher current because current costs you nothing, uh, and so you can go to lower voltage. So in general, there is a, no need to go to high voltages. Although there have been some projects. Occur in the past and going, going that are going up to maybe as much as 200 kilovolts of AC. But that's pretty much the limit. I don't think it's economic to go much because what you really want to do is to go to higher current, which means um, actually improving the performance of the superconducting wire, making a slightly bigger cable, yeah. and so on and so forth. So there's reasons there. Go back to the question a minute because I want to make sure I, yeah. I follow there. Okay. Are they greater than 100 kilovolts? Are there any demo projects? Yes, there are some. I think we're going to come to one. Um, in fact, well, no, I don't think I have a picture, but there was one done in China that was 100 and, 120 kilovolts, I think. Wow. Uh, but and, the, and in France, the, although they haven't done anything, they talked about a higher voltage. But, but my, opinion, my opinion is it doesn't make sense to go go to anything more than 150 kilovolts for a superconducting cable. People might argue with that. Now, when you come to a direct current, DC current, but even there, maybe plus minus 200 kilovolts um, is, is a good number. So in general, um, there are some demonstration projects, but I think we're focusing more on the lower. And in particular, the real economic applications are really going for this 23 kilovolt range and 10 kilovolt, because those cables are easy to make, are easier to make. And they're, they, the, there's two or three companies in the world already. There's three, two or three companies already in the world that are making those triaxial cables. There are a lot of, a lot of already understanding about it. The two, well, actually, the two big ones in the world are Nexans in Germany and LS cable in Korea. They're making the cables and the wire manufacturers are American Superconductor in the US. And then there's um, in in uh, Korea, there is a, a, a Sunam is making a wire and in Japan, Fujikura is making wire. And Sumitomo is making, remember that Bisco wire, that the, the silver, that's still being made and sold. Uh, mm -hmm. There are some applications where, and that's made by Sumitomo in Japan. So anyway, moving on. Okay, would superconducting cables fare better? From oh, that's an interesting question. From an EMP yes. or solar flare. Right. Um, uh, the, th the problem with the solar flares is it overloads the transformers and they flash over. 
Um, of course, a line, an overhead line, um, could flash over from one face to the other due to the magnetic field. I think that underground cables, both conventional and and superconducting, are not affected by flares. EMP, I'd have to think about that, but off the top of my head, I think no. But yeah, maybe. seems seems like the ground would ground. Well, it's 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 the in it's the so isn't that what a Faraday current. box does? Doesn't the Faraday box yeah. The, ground it's the, the, the Faraday yeah, box, it's, the box, right? Not well. Uh, it's, it's, it's around you know, the EMP. You would get an induced so current in the cables. You get an induced current in the cable, but my my guess is that the cables are rated for much higher current than they're normally operating at, and to induce a damaging current in an underground cable from a from a solar flare. Yeah, I, do, I haven't looked at this, but off the top of my head, I said that's not going to happen. But in a transformer, it's much more delicate uh, a situation, and you can wipe out the windings in a transformer pretty mm -hmm. easily with uh, with the magnetic fields from solar flares. As far as EMP, that's probably similar. I don't know. Anyway, kind of an area I don't know, but interesting question. Yeah. Let's move on. Um, so, um, okay, here's some... Here, okay, here's how it works to re improve reliability. Well, I guess I did. Okay, so one utility station substation fails and drops the customer's load. So then the customer loads are automatically transferred to the other substation. I already said that. So, all right. AC cable projects that are currently planned. This one is a, the one at the top of the diagram is a very exciting project it's being play, put in place in South Korea. It's a total of two kilometers. It'll be, it, when it's put in, it'll be, I think, the longest AC cable in the world, and it is wow. a fully commercial project. This is not a demonstration, um, and it's interconnecting the high voltage substations, 154 kilovolt with 23 kilovolts. So you can see that the trend here is to go away from high voltage down to low voltage because of this paradigm shift, and they're eliminating the high voltage transmission lines and the substations from urban areas for the reasons that I mentioned before. The Superlink project in Munich, Germany, that, well, that will be the longest, but I think that's further out. But 12 kilometers, that's a huge, that's a really big project. Now there's an example of, that's 110 kilovolts. So that's a little, that's a higher voltage, but notice the power level, 500 megawatts at MVA. So this is a big, that that is project on the, on the drawing boards today is, is that project. And it was just, uh, they're moving ahead with it. It was announced a couple of years ago, and they're they're moving ahead with it. And it's a local utility, but they're being strongly supported by the German government. And by the way, that that Korea project, strong government support. And yeah. then the one on the bottom there, the Tenet project, well, that was proposed, but um, in the Netherlands, um, they may come back and look at that again. That was an interesting project. Um, and I really, really wanted to see it go forward, and I hope it does, because in that project, they were going to pull out the conventional cable out of the underground pipes and wow. put the superconducting cable in it. Guess what that does? It completely saves all that digging up with the new thing. Yeah. You just use the existing infrastructure. And it looked like it was attractive, but there were various reasons, and I don't know what they were, probably political, that they didn't go through with it. That was several years ago. It was originally proposed. Um, at 2018. I think they're still thinking about it, but I don't have any updates on it. So moving on, um, unfortunately, I probably should have spent more time on DC cables in this presentation, because in my opinion, its superconductivity was made for DC cables. Huh. And one of the reasons is that I've been talking about no resistance haven't I? So I'm going to have to tell you that I've been lying to you a little bit. An <laughs> AC cable actually does resist soup current. An AC superconducting cable does have resistance, but it's not ohmic resistance. So technically, I'm correct. It's zero resistance. But the alternating current causes an alternating magnetic field in the cable, and you get a, you get a situation where you get some losses of anytime you're moving charges around by by Newton's first law, or second law rather, force equals the mass times, right? you're moving particles, you're moving something there, you're going to expend energy. So there is some losses, but it's very, very low. It's very, very tiny. 
a DC superconductor really genuinely literally has zero, zero uh, losses. And that's one reason why wow. DC cables are attractive. Um, another reason is this. An AC cable, whether it's superconducting or not, is a giant capacitor. Mm. It's a cylindrical capacitor. You've got the you've got the conductor down the middle, and then you have the shield around the outside. You have a cylindrical capacitor. Those of you who are electrical engineers know that if you put an alternating current at one end of a cylindrical capacitor, by the time you get to the other end, if it's long enough, you will have no voltage that left. That's that voltage that is um, um, in the same direction vectorially as the current. So you have no power. You still got voltage there, but it's now 90 degrees out of phase with the current. And so there's no power left. <clears throat> that doesn't matter what kind of cable. Wow. Super, um, if it's an AC cable underground with the way it's built. Now, overhead lines are a little different. They have their issues too. You can go maybe a couple hundred miles. But with an underground transmission cable, the most you can go is around 60 miles. And a, wow. a superconductor cable has a lower impedance than a, than a non than a conventional, so it can go maybe 100 miles. But there's a limit. A DC cable you can stretch clear across the country. Wow. Mm. Right. The only issue, of course, is you've got to cool it clear across the country. But <laughs> guess what? Yeah, but guess what? Wow. The power, the cooling, because there's no losses. Right. The cooling is independent of the power that flows. So the more power that flows, no more cooling. So the cost per, per unit of power goes down. The cost for cooling per unit of power goes down the more power you produce. That's not true of an AC, of conventional AC or even conventional HVDC cables because those are all ohmically driven. And so, and they're capacitive driven with their cables. They, the more power, the more losses you get. But a, a, a DC superconducting, D, superconductivity is made for DC DC cables or vice versa. It's a beautiful thing. Um, and I've spent a lot of time doing that. I guess I didn't, I've got some on that in this presentation, but not a whole lot. But you just heard my sermon on that. So let's move on here. Yeah, um, good stuff. There, are been, there have been several projects. Uh, there was one in Ishikari. I was I visited that one back in 2016, actually. Um, it's not no longer. It was a demo. The the best now the the second one there, the European Best Paths project, is a very interesting one because it's the only one that utilizes a, a, the magnesium diboride superconductor, hmm. and it, the cable was a very uniquely designed cable. It was designed and built by Nexans. And it has actually both, um, uh, let's see, it's got, it's hydrogen, oh boy, I think it's hydrogen cooled around the, around the superconductor. And then to, so that the hydrogen doesn't get boiled off too much, they have an outer layer of liquid nitrogen. So they got two cooling flows in there. It's wow. a yeah. cable. That'll yeah. take up it's, your price. <laughs> yeah. So, but it, it's a very, they claim the people who did this, it was it was a it was part of the um, uh, the um, the European Union uh, funded project. It's funded by uh, several countries. They claim, and the studies that have been done is that it's economic for use in places like Germany and other places because, um, particularly in Germany, because what hap what's happened in Germany, and again, I'm I don't know all the details. And some of them may may correct me on this, but in general, a lot of the power, first of all, you know that Germany dumped all of its nuclear, is, has, or, or will dump all of its nuclear power. Nuclear power so yeah. no more oh. nuclear power. You know, it's a little bit, a little bit of, um, <laughs> sorry about this, a little, you know, so, so what do they do? They buy their nuclear power from France. So, <laughs> so no, they're nice and green. They don't have any nuclear power. You know, they buy it from France. But they also do something else. They are very heavily invested in wind, lots of wind generation, but it's all up in the North Sea area. And most of the much of the load in Germany is in Southern Germany. How do you get all that power down to Southern Germany? Especially when you have a, 
a citizenry that doesn't want any more overhead lines because they're unsightly and they take up space and they cause EMF issues. And so the one of the answers, in fact, the answer that's being pursued is DC cables, um, maybe overhead, maybe underground, but conventional. The best path products was to show whether it could be done with a superconducting cable and they economically against a conventional DC cable with conventional cover. They claim, and I haven't looked at the results, but they claim that it, it would work. That's that project. There's one that's um, in Japan at the University of Kyushu. And then a good one in, in Russia, St. Petersburg. And unfortunately, I think they've, they've run into some difficulties there. But it was a very attractive project, interconnecting substations. And here's another thing about DC, particularly. And this is where the Russian project was very interesting. And it's the ah. only one. And that is this. Well, you may not know that because of Ohm's law, um, mm -hmm. electricity power goes where the, where the resistance is the least. Yes. And when deregulation came into the U.S., that created a lot of problems because um, you've got utility here serving somebody else's customers and their own lines are getting used because they couldn't regulate the flow of power because you can't regulate it with AC. It's just going to go where the lowest path is. With DC, that's not the case because the... The, the one of the offsetting costs of DC is you have to have a converter that goes from DC to AC because most power is consumed in the US yeah. or any country at AC levels. Right. So you have to convert from the DC to the AC and that's called a converter. That's a cost, but the advantage is that's a power electronics device that you can control. So you decide how much power goes through your line. You can't do that with an AC line. And that's what they were gonna show in St. Petersburg. The project, I think, is still in the planning. They've built some, but I'm not sure where where they're 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 still working on it. So moving on. Um, yeah, quick quick. Dave says uh, I feel like I've taken the Krell intelligence test. My mind has greatly expanded. Yeah, I don't know what the, what the Krell intelligence. I don't test either. Is. Um, it's uh, referring to Forbidden Planet, where oh, uh, yeah, he yeah, took yeah, yeah, the yeah. mind. Um, increasing tests right. to figure out what the it was that was killing yeah. all the people, and it was I forgot about that. Yeah, Thank you. The, and <laughs> it was the Krell that were the pe the name of the the people that lived on the planet. Yeah, uh, right, yeah. Right. Robbie the robot, and yeah, Morpheus, Morpheus Professor yeah. Morpheus, um, and yeah, it turned out that they all discover using all this power that their minds were doing they could just think of something to do but it was all the uh what do you call it the uh the, the ancient um it, it, bad stuff was coming out at night and it, they all died because they went out and killed everybody uh and the power plant was the only thing left left behind yeah. uh yeah <laughs> And they, what an yeah. amazing movie. It was a really good movie. Uh, have it on DVD at home. Watched it a million times. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so um, I, have a space I got one though. more DC cable project, I think, here. And that's the, this was recently finished. It was on the island, Jeju Island, just off the coast of South Korea. They had mm. a combination AC and DC system there. Huh. It was a demonstration. Uh, project and I think it's been decommissioned at this point. But they wanted to they wanted to understand in particular how does the DC cable work in an AC network? And one of the issues was the control thing that I was talking about. In particular, because this is an island, so it's fed from off from the mainland of, of South Korea. They, I don't they may have some on island generation, but it's not enough. So the most of the power to the island comes in an undersea cable. And undersea cables work better for DC than for AC. Uh, again, because of the distance issues, yes. uh, even conventional DC cables. And so a superconducting cable could be smaller, have higher power. And so they, this was a demonstration project. It was very successful. It worked and they learned a lot from it. Um, moving on, let's talk about some of the benefits here. Well, I've mentioned along the way, we've, I've, I've covered some of these, but let's see what we've got. First of all, you're going to eliminate the EMF from overhead AC lines. That's mm. a, it's probably an issue that's overblown by people. It's not studies have been done, especially mm. by by my former company as well as others that 
EMF from AC lines probably isn't the health um, danger that yes. it's touted to be, but who knows? Anyway, there's no EMF from an underground um, super, especially a DC cable if it's done right. Um, but in any event, it's underground, not overhead. And um, although there are issues if you're walking on the street <laughs> where there's an AC cable, but that's one of the issues. Um, I mentioned this very on, early on in the presentation. There's the thermal independence from the surrounding environment. You don't have to backfill that trench with special material. That is huge. The cost of, of instruct, uh, the installation cost of a conventional underground transmission cable using copper, the installation cost is 60% of the cost, just wow. the installation. Wow. And a lot of it is driven by that point right there. Um, next one. As we saw, it's up to five times a cable. Um, once you put the cable together, it's not the 150 times I showed in an earlier slide, but the cable is about five to six times the carrying capacity of a copper cable. So you can obviously put five times fewer cables in a sense, or small, a fifth the area, because um, they operate at high current rather than high voltage. Um, the cooling medium, is liquid nitrogen, which is non-toxic and environmentally friendly. Um, of course, conventional you know cables don't use a fluid, but they have transformers at the ends of them with oil. Um, yeah. And the oil is not very nice. Now, of course, a uh, superconducting a cable will have a transformer too, but it'll be a lower voltage transformer. So it'll be smaller with less oil. That's maybe a bit of a... Um, I, know, I know that the oils that they do use in the transformers is actually carcinogenic as well. Oh, jeez. Yes, it is. Um, then we've got um, the compact designs. As we mentioned, they can fit. And I told you about that one project where they would have existing underground pipes that were going to be mm -hmm. retrofitted. And then there's the lower power losses which means it translates to high efficiency, which translates to lower CO2 emissions. So those are some of the it benefits. Mean, it really means that they can actually sell more power because they're saving. <laughs> right. yes. and, but the thing is, the people, the citizenry of the world demand more power. We're becoming yeah. a very electrified very power hungry. Um, yep. civilization. Yep. Very dependent on electricity. It looks, okay, looks like I missed a one. comment. Looks like I missed a comment. Hold on. Sorry, okay. Daniel, uh, but he says this makes microgrids and electric car to grid look cost effective to uh, also neighborhood scale on a neighborhood scale, uh, community solar, etc. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I would agree. <laughs> mm. Oh, boy. <laughs> Here's one that just came in. Janie says uh, laugh out loud joke share question. Why do why don't uh start carry uh, oh stars carry luggage on vacation because they are traveling light last thing for special <laughs> spring thanks dr Arkroad. fascinating train. okay good you're welcome and you you want the slide yeah. right oh and uh oh hey don i didn't know you were here fascinating topic thanks, Hi, don. okay awesome you. you got you got another slide right oh i got a few more but uh okay. they're all soon here, we talked about the cables are indeed needed. We talked about lower cost wire. Um, refrigerations need to be made more efficient uh, and more reliable. New materials for cryogenic insulation. Uh, we need to have ways of mitigating high fault currents, for, especially for DC cables. Um, and then the system contingencies, the loss of the superconducting cable. These are some of the things that are needed still. Um, there's other system components that use superconductivity. I talked about those briefly. I'm going to skip on here. Here's my, this is my last few slides and my vision for the future, or not just my vision. This was put together by myself, um, the founder of the Electric Power Research Institute, which is Chauncey Starr, died a few years ago, and Paul Grant, one of my colleagues and a bit of a mentor in, and a mentor in superconductivity. He died just a couple of months ago. So oh. this is called, uh, this is, Here's the vision. This is pretty much mostly Paul, but from uh, contributions from the other people I mentioned. So, so here it is. Superconducting cables and fault current limiters in urban locations. Substations that are all superconducting. That means not just the cable, but the transformer 
everything in it, it that can be made superconducting fault current limiters there. Um, a continental superconducting power grid. Remember one of the questions wow. was a, a, around the planet? Well, I yep. told you, we talked about moving power clear across the continent. So that's part of the vision. Now, here's an interesting thing. Large scale energy storage. What you do is you use hydrogen, liquid hydrogen, or gaseous hydrogen, liquid hydrogen, actually, to cool the cable. Yes. But be, because, uh, I'm sorry, I should have gaseous hydrogen, because it can be compressed and therefore it can store energy by just right. compressed gas. Okay. And at the end of it, if you're using hydrogen at the other end, you can use it to drive fuel cells right. for cars. Yeah. Okay. Right, exactly. So, so then we have a closed loop nuclear hydrogen hydrogen system incorporating renewable nuclear power, renewable, superconducting hydricity, which is what that means is uh, hydrogen and electrons, hydrogen for fuel and electrons for electric power. And Paul coined the term hydricity for that, distributed fuel cells and hydrogen and fuel storage. So here's a picture. Wow. Symbiosis of nuclear. And so what you see there, this is one of our concepts. This is a cross, an intercontinental maglev train going from across the country, say, uh -huh. in a tunnel in most places. Mm -hmm. And in the same tunnel at the top, you see the superconducting DC cable. It's a DC cable. Remember, it can go long distance. Okay, and then here's some of the pictures. Nuclear power generates electricity and hydrogen. Um, it's distributed in the underground pipelines, just like natural gas is. Um, the infrastructure can take the form of a super grid, and there's a picture across the country of um, various plants. One of the advantages here is it. some people say object to nuclear, and I can tell you a story about nuclear, but it can be any distant power system it can be up in the you know wind power for example is often not the not very close to the places where the power is used so right. the idea here is remote power plants interconnected by the um by the superconducting dc line and then you've got then the other one that paul came up with was a city that's driven it's a completely self-contained city and he called that a super city. Um, and it has the nuclear plant, and then it has the hydrogen for the family car, the whatever. He's got various things there. And he's using the MGB2 con conductor. So he gets uh, the, this is an eight high temperature gas cooled reactor, which is a, an advanced reactor that does not have the issues. You, you can use um, fuel that is, is, can be re reprocessed so that you're not coming up with nuclear waste. Um, you make electricity or you can make hydrogen. Um, reactors. And then um, then there's the cable cross section, the flowing liquid hydrogen. Okay, thermal insulation, electrical insulation, then trench underground. Yeah. So you got hydrogen for personal transportation. There's this was under, um, I think, the first President Bush. And maybe Jimmy Carter, Jimmy Carter days, okay, mm. with a big, big push on, or maybe it was first push. I don't remember now. Um, hydrogen, fuel cells in cars. Mm -hmm. Not anymore. We don't talk about it, but it's still possible. Storage. They're actually, they're actually looking at that in Australia. Oh, seriously? Okay. Yeah, they actually have a hydrogen fueling station for hydrogen cell cars, and there are a few hydrogen cell cars. Running around, uh, yeah, it's the infrastructure. I yeah, think it's it's, it's a it's in like testing and development stage, but they are looking seriously at that 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 wow. that, that, that process. Uh, yeah, See, yeah and the nice thing. This Go came ahead, in a, question a little here, bit right? ago. Yeah, I heard the gases uh, used in high voltage disconnect switches are ozone destroying. Is that the case? Yeah, um, some. Uh, yes, some switches and some cables use sulfur hexafluoride, SF6. Oh, wow. It is a greenhouse gas, um, so that is true. That is not a factor in this scenario here. Okay. And, and just in defense of the utility industry, there's a lot worse things for the 
for uh, greenhouse gases, including termites in cows, which oh, produce yeah. methane, which is a methane is a much more uh, harmful. Is a much more. Mm. It's much. It's much stronger breakdown of, of ozone, a creator of ozone than ozone layer five, than five, is, five, um, five times stronger. Oh, yeah. I didn't know, five I didn't times, know. yeah, more damaging. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So anyway, um, well, thanks for that, Steve. So and and the thing, Cliff, about the cars, the hydrogen in this vision, the hydrogen comes through the line. It's used to cool the. Cool the right. superconductor, but as it comes out the line, you use it for fuel because you're generating yeah. it at the other end. Yeah. Okay. The next is industrial thermal chemical processing uses hydrogen, residential and commercial heating using hydrogen, and electricity for just about everything else. Wow. And you know and what you get when you burn hydrogen? Water. Water. Yeah. So it's clean. And we managed to do this in under two hours. <laughs> yes. Fantastic. Wow. Oh, so amazing. <laughs> and we had a lot of questions, a lot of comments, yeah, a lot of good yes. questions. Good, good questions there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, very good So questions. if you want to go over, I guess you know, you'll you'll say, Pam, that this is a YouTube show so they can go back and look. Uh, yes. You know, yes. study some of the points. And by the way, if anybody has any questions, you can put my email address up there. Send me an email. Uh, if I can answer the question, I will. I may not be able to. Or, and if I can, I can probably direct you to a place that you can do a little more research because I'm kind of really into all this stuff. So there's my email address. You're welcome to give me, send, shoot me an email. You're welcome to visit my website um, yep. where you can see my, you can see the telescope that I use on my web. One of the two telescopes that I use. That's uh, this one, website. right? This one, Steve? Which uh, one? Which that? Ecuador.com? Ecuador yeah, Ecuador is, is the website okay. that you can find out about my books, and my writing philosophy. And I've got a really nice post on there about women astronomers. Yep. I mentioned that to uh, Pam and Cliff yep. earlier um, and how important they have been and continue oh, to be hell yeah. for oh, astronomy today. Nowadays, oh. it's not a big deal, but 100 years ago, it was a big yeah. problem. Boy, uh, we, so got got we got a lot of comments. We got a lot of comments while we're looking at those. Uh, we've got Thomas, and uh, so glad the new people came. That's really appreciate that. Uh, really appreciate the talk and great info on slides to look up later. Yes, uh, saw you have your sci-fi books on Amazon. Do you plan to write technical text again? Also, will you be sharing slides? Ooh. Well, I, okay. The question, Thomas, is um, I haven't written any technical text unless you call this slide a technical text. So, yeah, I could. There's other things I could do. One of the things in my book, Copernicium, draws upon another background area that I had. I worked. I used to work at Lawrence Laboratory in Berkeley back in the '70s when they were looking into transuranium elements. We mm. were trying. We were actually trying to synthesize things like copernicium. Wow. And, and I learned a lot about, it was called nuclear chemistry. They would call it nuclear physics today, but it really is the chemistry of the nucleus. And I learned a lot about that. And so when I wrote Copernicium 296, the main plot driver is a transuranic element called trans, called Copernicium, which is a real element, by the way. It's element number 112. In the yeah. 70s, when I worked at Lawrence Laboratory, we hadn't, we'd only gotten up to about 107. Uh, which is um, now named, um, well, I forgot what, 106 um, Borim and then 107, forget. Anyway, you can look on the periodic table. They're up to 118 now. Right. 112, Copernicium was synthesized in Germany about 10 years ago, I think. But yeah. when I wrote the book, I, I wanted to have something that all these elements, transuranic elements, everything above uranium is is uh, um, it's radioactive and decays in just milliseconds or seconds. It doesn't last. It doesn't stick around. So they are all made. They're all manufactured. Copernicium two ninety six in the plot driver in my book is an, is naturally occurring on this planet in in the in the world that I created, and so and I used my understanding of of Copernicia, of, of nuclear chemistry in that. You can find a post on my website under under the post page on on some of the science associated with Copernic with why I used Copernicium and how it relates and why why 
with 296 nucleons in it, 112 protons and 184 nu neutrons, that why that particular isotope of copernicium is stable is explained mm -hmm. in that post. So that's yeah, an area agree. where I pulled on some of my, my background earlier in my career when I was working um, at the laboratory. Then I moved, I moved into electrical power stuff after that. But I love the nuclear chemistry thing. And, and um, my mentor, the guy I worked for, Albert Giosa, he died now, but he should have gotten a Nobel Prize. Uh, he, oh. he invented, he synthesized probably a half a dozen of the transuranic elements that wow. we have today. And I, ha I was his lab assistant <laughs> at the time. So wow. I, learned, I learned a lot uh, there. So Jeez. that's the copernicium. Is Somebody asked about superconic TV. Yeah, another comment. Can you yes. use you can use concentrated solar thermal to disassociate? Uh, yes, you can absolutely. Oh. And so a large a large scale thermal solar plant out in the middle of nowhere. Now you use um, you can transport that power using obviously power lines to places that it's being used. And the vision that we ended this presentation with is a one way of thinking about doing that. Mm -hmm. It's a good point. Do we get CEUs? Well, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, That'd be something they, they could do. I mean, right? It's just um, probably. I don't know. What would I have to do? To, do I have to do something to make that happen? I don't know. Uh, you got anybody in the government you know? <laughs> uh, great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Another one. No, thanks. Okay. And, Thank and, you. Yeah. It's been fabulous. Yeah. It's been thanks fabulous. for your comments and questions, Daniel. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, too. and you covered the. You, said, you asked me to ask you something if you did not cover it, but you did. Oh, and here comes Daniel with uh, the average human body has the remnants of a thousand supernovas. Uh, yes. yes, as Carl Sagan said, we're uh, we're all made of stardust. Stardust, stardust. right? And right. by the way, that that is a very prominent theme in um, my third book, Arcoi. Ah. Um, I, I, actually, it's a prominent theme in a sense, because it starts Shauna on her journey because she's one, she's driven by these thoughts and she has a, she has a telepathic communication with the, with the Arkoi at the very beginning of her journey. She doesn't know it's the Arkoi at the time. And one of the exchanges that goes on is she's talking telepathically to these beings. Uh, and one of the comments is about being stardust, and it's Carl Sagan's comment. Oh, can't wait to read them. Uh, we'll watch for more comments. Steve, we got a couple little little pieces still for the show. Uh, okay, you can go up. My my turn. Yeah, Yay! yeah. Uh, some stellar events this week, March the twenty second through March the 29th. I'm here in the U.S. on my way to the the solar eclipse in Texas. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm back again from 2017. So I, I was a tour guide on a tour bus for a tour group, uh, in Yellowstone. Um, Dave Renike and I were, uh, who is a lot, Dave Renike, who is a local science writer and a talkback radio host in Australia, in Australia <laughs> on 13 radio stations around, around the country. Um, that informs a lot of people about what's going on in space. Uh, and I were there in 2017 um, to see, see this yeah. brilliant um, um, total eclipse. And you're going to share the picture there? Oh, yes. Got a picture. Yes, yes, yes. I got Where a the heck did it go? picture. What did you do with the picture? There it is. There you go. Oh, oh. Let me adjust it a little Hang bit. Hang on. you got to adjust it a little bit here. There you go. But that's my camera shot. Um, Very nice. Um, wow. Yes. And I think, I believe the little white dot. There is supposed to be the oh, planet. Here? Yep, that's supposed to be the planet Mercury. <gasps> wow, how because, cool is that? It was, it was close to the sun at that, that time. So uh, it actually yeah. just put a little glimpse in there because all the stars are all blanked out because they're, they're, it's just so, so, yeah. so bright. But that, that was the, because it's so big. Show it, that again. It, Show it again. Right? Sure. Show it again, sure. Now, where is the little dot? It's, it's really hard to see. It's in this. really hard, hard to see, but it's can you right put your, here. Can you see it? There? Oh, I see it. Yep, I see it. Yep. That's I see it. Cool. That's great. That's really neat. So um, I've actually, 
I actually got a, a, a shot of a total eclipse of the moon one time and I actually got wow. the planet Uranus right beside the moon. And you actually tell it was a little little funny <laughs> coloured ball. That's amazing. So, uh, and you wouldn't have seen it unless the moon was in eclipse. So that's right. my second right. shot. I've got a two planets on two special occasions. Yeah. One was a total eclipse of the sun and one was a total eclipse of the moon. All right. I should have put that up there too. <laughs> Next piece. Uh, yeah, we, I'd like to see one of yours. Oh, yeah. Oh, damn. Uh, March the 23rd, the moon at Apogee. March 24th, moon on the equator. And Mercury at its greatest western elongation, 19 degrees east of the sun. March uh -huh. the 25th is the full worm moon. God knows what that is in Australia. <laughs> um, what what does it mean? Worm moon. What There's is just names. It's like it's any. It's like you've got a name of what it is. It's, yeah. Anyway, we got a picture of that. We got it's, a uh, picture. So is that um, where we're at? I think that yeah, it's a penumbral. Um, penumbral eclipse of, of yeah. Yeah. Let me let me share that one too because. So it's not not a a full eclipse. It's just in the partial shadow. Um, yeah. You know, so you don't when, when it turns it. the colors, it's kind of in that really dark place. Dark. In it's that just a shadow. dark, yeah, it darkens the moon. And so, like, you're looking at it and it's slowly just, huh, it's getting blacker and blacker for some reason. Yeah, uh, we got we got the peanut gallery <laughs> timing him. <laughs> yeah. For the warm moon. Oh, we, we, okay. missed, uh, we missed one from Daniel, too. Uh, maybe low temperature quantum computing can be combined with power transmission. Broadband quantum over power lines. <laughs> yeah, laugh out loud. Yeah. Woo, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, and yeah, where we go? And a penumbral of the moon. Um, you shared screen. Yep. It's not overly impressive, but the moon won't turn red or brown. It's in just one part of the shadow, not the darkest part. March 26th, the moon at, at a descending node. March the 29th, Friday night show. Another guest will be here. Find out who shortly. I guess I can stop that. You want to read the rest? Oh, there uh, is. <laughs> find Jeff and Pam on Friday nights um, at 9 p.m. Pacific time on every, on the Everyday Space of Facebook page and the Everyday Space YouTube channel. Thank you. What inspires you the most for this coming week? I think this talk from Steve has done that uh you know what i'm gonna skip this part you got to skip this part yeah yeah there's a there's just a few today uh and i'll show i can show them next week we've been uh, uh sharing other events and so forth uh but this has gone on a very long time long and time i know today. for people on the east coast it's like two in the morning let's do this real quick for janie <laughs> yeah. janie says great full of stars show with everyday space of celebrities thank you everyone thank you janie uh, so if you or someone you know has done something interesting involving space exploration, yeah, science, astronomy on. like that, we'd love we'd to, share, love our to share our lives. Yeah. Uh, so join us next Friday, March the 29th. Cliff will be here again. Yes, I will be. Dawn is going to be our guest, and those two are going to are talk, talk about the upcoming eclipse. And uh, Dawn and I are uh, going to rattle on that for hours. Oh, you put hours on. <laughs> Probably not hours. No, not hours. But there, but, uh, there is uh, yes. quite a bit. Oh, quite and, a bit. Oh, here we go, Dawn. Yeah, looking forward to next week's show. And, of course, Totality. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so I've come all the way from Australia to come and see the Total Eclipse again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, wasn't sponsored by anybody. No yeah. free trips. Uh, all out of my own pocket. Oh, and it's good. going around, I'm actually also going to see meet up with Tom Pickett, who's oh. made the a great, a great discovery in space of an asterism around uh, Betelgeuse um, and then go to the American and Space Air Museum down in Florida and doing a, a YouTube video with Mark Marquette um, and then going up to meet some of the, the people that were on the tour bus that I still uh, talk to and they're going to take me around Virginia and we're going to go to the UVARD um hazy smithsonian air museum again because spent four hours there last time didn't touch the surface it's so bloody big the yank you yanks do so yeah you got big <laughs> man big is big so um what yeah. is that daniel 73 is that a qr uh qc that's a ham radio. radio 
Yeah, right, right. 73 from extra class am KK6VDR. What's the 73 mean? I don't know that one. 73. Yeah. PT73. You know, remember Mikhail's name? Um, <laughs> no, it's a, it's a uh, ham radio thing. Oh, okay. And then there's, you got, um, 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 what is it? Um, 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 73 that uh, Sheldon always wore and he had his t-shirt. Oh. 73 is a good number. So, That's it. Yeah. All right. We'll do, we'll do a shout out real quick and we'll still watch for your comments. Big bang theory. Yep. Right. <laughs> uh, we'll still watch for your comments. Um, it may be like something we'll talk to you on like YouTube and, and Facebook and stuff. So anyway, Daniel, Jeff, thanks for, for being here. Thomas, uh, Don, Jamie Becker. Who else do we have? We have some new people. Thanks so much for oh, being here. Good on Scott, you, mate. Good on yep, you, mate, for Dave, ca catching Jamie, on. Jamie, Thomas. We said Thomas. Uh, wow, what a great night. Thanks, everybody. It always makes yeah. it a better show. Thomas, you yep. get Thomas there. When, uh, when you talk to us and, and tell us stuff, <laughs> because, you know, crowdsourcing, like the Copper Futures, that was really good. Uh, I think we got everybody, I right? I think we got everybody there. Oh, uh, no, here oh, we go. Kenneth Garcia. Kenneth Garcia. Thanks for, he did the... Um, the, the doctor, uh, oh, doctor, you know how to say it. And you, <laughs> yeah, right. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> it's another Spanish I'll word. Cool, yes, it is. <laughs> Scott, all right. Worried. Wow, what a great show. Thank you, everyone. So we've had a so, lot of questions. So much. And yes, it really has exciting. been uh, very, very interesting what you've been saying there, Steve. Yeah, um, yeah. It's uh, uh, very long term and knowledgeable. That, yes. uh, you've obviously um, spent a lot of time. <laughs> And it uh, seems studying. like it's just kind of getting started and there's going to be a lot more development. Is, is, that, is that true? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. Well, even... I even like, should say, Pam, too, that thank you because this has kind of re-energized some of my interests. I kind of... Not that I've dropped out of the field, but I haven't been as engaged uh, as I became in the last couple of weeks putting this whole thing together. So thank you. Excellent. Um, and also, if we learn how to to develop this technology, well, they're going to go and mine on the moon and stuff like that. The less stuff they have to take with them, the smaller the, yep. the size, yeah. um, the less weight, mass. Um, yeah, the benefits that um, spacecraft, it, it, the the you know it, anything's the limit. You know what I mean? Anything's the limit. Yep. What what it could go to. So yeah, exactly. that's that's really really cool stuff to look to know. Oh, we got another comment. Uh, another comment. Oh, I see seventy three or uh, best wishes, best regard. Oh, okay, uh, best regard. Okay. Yeah. Thank that's, you, dear. that's great. I love it's that. It's like ten four, good buddy. Seventy three. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks, folks. We'll, we'll see you next week and have a great one. Take good care. Good night. Seventy three. <laughs>